with that said, as I mentioned, we're only going to be going through chapter 36 tonight. We're going to be looking at what I, what I called Elihu's monologue. And it's really the end of his speech that he's making. So let's begin reading together here in the book of Job at chapter 36. We'll read verses 1 through 4 and we'll get into our study. Job chapter 36, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Elihu also proceeded and said, Bear with me a little, and I will show you that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what we have here is Elihu, once again, this is the young man who had been silently listening as Job had been arguing with his three friends who had traveled to come and bring words of comfort and then began an argument. And as we've been watching this, we saw how that Elihu began to uh, speak and to give his opinion. And so he's continuing his monologue at this point at this point by telling his listeners that they need to bear with him a little. You see, he's been lecturing Job, and he's made it clear that as he was sharing with him that he considered Job to be prideful. Not only was Job filled with pride, but he also had gone on to say that his friends who were trying to, to speak to him were, were really incompetent. You see, if his friends were better equipped, he was saying, they could have convinced Job of his sin because Elihu believes that Job is in sin. Well, you see, as we've gone through the, uh, the arguments that Job has been having with his friends, we, we've seen that he continued claiming his innocence, and his friends had failed to convince him otherwise. And because of this, Elihu felt it necessary to step into the argument. And so Elihu is convinced that he's filled with great wisdom. He's a younger man. He's younger than the rest, but he felt, he felt superior to them. And uh, when he began speaking, he gave them the reason that he had been silent. We saw in chapter 32, verse 7, how he had said, I said, age should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. So that's how he actually began. I was quiet because I thought you older people, because you've lived so long, should be the ones who speak and, and give the, uh, the wise counsel to Job. But with that said, he began to launch into an assault, an assault upon Job. He said, my words come from an upright heart. I'm speaking pure knowledge. Well, he had just finished saying that Job opens his mouth in vain and he talks too much. And he thought that Job hadn't learned his lesson, which resulted in the lengthening of his trial that he was enduring. Because if he'd have learned anything, Ali who has been saying, he wouldn't be speaking in the manner that he is. And so, that's what Elihu is doing now. He's, he's bringing words of rebuke and all, and he's continuing now in chapter 36 to, to, uh, to make his speech and conclude it. And so he says again in verse 2, Bear with me a little. I will show you that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. So allow me to continue until I have finished what I have to say. You see, there are still things to say in order to justify why God has treated you like this, Job. When he says in verse 3, I will fetch my knowledge from afar, I will ascribe righteousness to my maker, he's simply saying, I'm going to teach you things that are both ancient and deep in wisdom. I'm going to teach you things that are ancient and very deep. When we began this book, when we were in chapter 8, one of Job's friends, his name was Bildad. Bildad had said in Job chapter 8, verse 8, ask the former generation, find out what their ancestors learned. And so what Eliu is simply saying is similar to what Bildad has said when he's saying, I'm going to give to you right now wisdom that is ancient, wisdom that we all have been taught, that we've all had passed on, to us. I'm going to teach you what the former generation has already known, what our ancestors have already learned. He says in verse 3, I'll ascribe righteousness to my maker. So the things that I will now say will prove that he is righteous and 
is to be trusted. Now, that may be in contrast to what he thinks Job has been saying when he says, God has treated me in an unfair way. So he goes on in verse 4 to say, For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. So when he says one who is perfect in knowledge is with you, the commentators that I use were kind of divided on this. Um, some were saying that they believe that, that he's saying the one in reference to God. But the ones that I think are, 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 are right on this one, it would seem that Elihu is speaking of himself. It would seem that Elihu is simply saying, I'm not a novice. I'm not immature. Just because I'm younger than you doesn't mean I don't know the things that you know. I am seasoned and I am wise. And it seems that he's claiming spiritual maturity and spiritual wisdom. And so he's saying, I, I'm speaking truthfully. I have complete confidence. And I have a complete confidence that I'm speaking for God. I'm speaking on God's behalf. He had said that in verse 2. I'm speaking for God. Now, as I read this, and I'm not creating this for myself, the others that I use, and I use several different commentators, uh, it, it seems that Elihu is speaking from a heart filled with arrogance. Listen, and I'll make this real practical, as practical, practical as I can. Um, if you have a desire to give advice, and I think it's a good thing that sometimes we need to, I think sometimes we who've been walking with the Lord for a while, sometimes we're called on to give advice. So if you are called on to give advice, do so with humility. It, 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 doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't work well if you come with a sense of pride or arrogance. It just doesn't. So... Humility should be what is prompting him to give advice, not, not a desire to prove that he's equal in understanding and experience. Uh, if you take notes, you might want to note Romans 15, verse 14. Paul was writing there to the church, and he said this. He said, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. If you're going to be instructing one another, Paul was saying, you need to be full of goodness and filled with knowledge. If you're full of goodness, the goodness is going to balance the knowledge. If you're not filled with goodness, then pride and arrogance is going to be the motivator of you bringing correction. But if you have a, a relationship with the Lord and a sense of humility before him and you understand who you are, especially in comparison to who he is. And if you have sympathy and concern for the people that you need to bring a word of correction to, well, that goes a long way because you really aren't going to be effective in your ministry to people until you've learned to weep with those who weep. You need to learn how to, and I have to learn, we have to learn how to hear with our heart in some ways, to understand. Because sometimes people will say things that they don't intend to say, and we immediately jump on what they're saying and correct them for what they're saying, when in fact that's not what they intended to say at all. And so if we will listen with a little charity, you can sometimes bring a healing. And there needs to be that. So what we need is, is we need goodness, a moral goodness. We need to have a knowledge of the things of the Lord, and we need to be competent to instruct one another. It, it seems to me that Elihu is speaking from a heart that's filled with young arrogance. And so as he's going on, he says in verse 5, Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked, but gives justice to the oppressed. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings, for he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters, held in the cords of affliction, then he tells them their work and their transgressions that they have acted defiantly. And so he begins to speak. And notice how he begins in verse 5. God is mighty. Unlike human beings, God does not, even though he is mighty, despise and oppress those who are weak. Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He's mighty in strength. Unlike human beings, 
God's greatness doesn't cause him to oppress those who are weak. His strength is guided by his wisdom. And because his strength is guided by his wisdom, Elihu says, that prevents him from being a tyrant. In verse 6, he does not preserve the life of the wicked. He gives justice to the oppressed. God doesn't favor the wicked. He ultimately judges them. And God will deliver those who are oppressed. He gives vindication to those who are oppressed by the wicked. So he's saying God is mighty, but he's also just. Now remember in chapter 10, verse 3, Job had asked, is it good to you, speaking to the Lord, is it good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands? And he goes on, he says, look favorably upon the counsel of the wicked. And so Job had felt that the Lord was treating him unfairly. And so Elihu's responding to that. He says in verse 7, he doesn't withdraw his eyes from the righteous. Job implied that God had withdrawn himself from him, though Job himself was righteous. And again, he said in, Job said in chapter 29, verse 2, he said, oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me. So he's saying God has withdrawn himself, but Elihu says he doesn't withdraw his eyes from the righteous. Why? Well, Psalm 34, 15 says the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. So Elihu is saying this. He's saying God watches over the righteous. And not only does he watch over the righteous, but often he elevates them into high positions. It's like what the psalmist said in Psalm 113, verses 7 and 8. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. So God watches over the righteous is what he's saying here. In verse 8, he says, if they are bound in fetters, held in cords of affliction, then he tells them their work and their transgressions, that they have acted defiantly. So when the righteous are afflicted, he says, God will deal with them, but he also reveals why he's chastening them. He moves on into verse 10 and says, he also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity, their years in pleasures. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. So here we go. Elihu gives his reason as to why he thinks Job is suffering. And he's saying, the reason you're going through what you're going through, Job, it's because God is disciplining you in order that he might restore you. Now in Hebrews, if you take notes, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7, listen to what the writer said. He says, you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? So these two boys were fighting. And no, they weren't my boys. There were two boys fighting on the playground. And a man came. And he separated the boys and he took one of them and swatted him. And the other one he let go. And somebody who was watching walked up to this man and said, look, I have to ask you a question. Those kids, both of them were wrong. Both of them were doing what is wrong. Yet you let one go and the other one you spanked. Why did you do that? And so the man said, easy. The one I let go is not my son. The one I spanked is. And that's a fact, isn't it? Those of you who are parents, I don't know about you. I don't know if you beat up the neighborhood kids as well as your son. <laughs> but I had a tendency of disciplining my son because he's my son. He belongs to me. And if you're going through discipline, if you're going through chastening, despise it not because he loves you and is treating you as a son, as his, as his child. And that's how discipline works. And so he's speaking concerning this. And he's speaking how God works in these kinds of things, how God ministers and how God brings correction. 
Again, he said, if they obey and serve him, verse 11, they shall spend their days in prosperity, their years in pleasure. He's saying normally their lives will be blessed, but verse 12, if they don't obey, they shall perish by the sword. They shall die without knowledge. So God brings correction because in doing so, he saves those who belong to him. In verse 13, but the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth. Their life ends among the perverted persons. He delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. So when he says the hypocrites in heart store up wrath, the word hypocrite in, its, in this context is, is speaking of what are called the godless, those without God. And, and these, these are the godless, those who live an entire life rejecting God. These are the ones who reject him completely, and they never seek him, and they never, they never pray to him. Notice verse 13, they do not cry for help when he binds them. They do not pray for, ha for help. They don't speak to him. When, when they're bound with affliction, what they do is they harden their hearts, and they reject calling on him. He's saying they can die young, and notice after death, he says, they're going to go to hell. They're going to be with those who have rejected God. That's what he's saying. It says they die in youth, and their life ends among the perverted persons, those who have rejected God. They're going to go to a place of judgment. We've been going through Revelation, guys, and in Revelation 21.8, we just recently read this. It says the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so he says that he binds them. He says then they, they die in youth and their life ends among the perverted persons. They die and they suffer judgment. But he goes on in verse 15 to say he delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. So he continues on and speaks about delivering. You see, the thing that I didn't touch on, let me, let me touch on this because I, I forgot to mention that. It was in verse 13. It says, the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. Well, that reminded me of Romans in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, how Paul had said this in the book of Romans. And he said to those who were rejecting the things of the Lord, he says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when the righteous judgment will be revealed. You're storing up wrath. The word storing up can refer to treasuring up. It means to lay it aside and to build up. And what you're doing is by rejecting God's grace, every day you add to his wrath. By rejecting his forgiveness, every day you're adding to the account of judgment. Every day that you wait and never come to faith in Christ, you've stored up wrath for the day of wrath. And that's an ancient thought that you see right here in verse 13 of chapter 36. The hypocrites in heart store up wrath and judgment indeed will come. So when he says in verse 15 again, he delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. We can talk about that for just a moment. There are many lessons that the righteous poor learn. The righteous poor learn. There are many lessons that they learn through affliction. What happens is they are caused to hear and understand God in a way that is deeper. In our day, the idea of actually going through affliction, pain, suffering, obviously it's never been popular. I, when I got saved, I, I wasn't really warned or told or taught the day I got saved about what it meant to follow the Lord in terms of just a lifetime and what does it mean and what are you going to go through. 
But I've discovered that. I've discovered some deep things about the Lord through the things that I've gone through. I, I didn't ask God to put me through these things. God knows I wouldn't have asked for them. But I've gone through things as you have. I've gone through times of pain, times of tears, times of suffering, times of sickness, times of loss. I've gone through all that. Of course, that's part of being a human being. We all do. For some reason, when I first got saved, though, I thought that now that I'm a Christian, these things are going to pass me by. I'm not going to suffer. I'm never going to cry again. I'm never going to be hurt again. I'm never going to be disappointed again. I looked at the family of God as being the, a perfect family, a wonderful family. They're all going to be loving and kind. And, uh -huh. <laughs> and I discovered something about sheep. You know how the Lord calls us his sheep. Sheep may not be scary, but they do have teeth. And they do bite. And sometimes they, 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 they can injure. We can injure one another, of course. And there are times that, that you may go through things, maybe, maybe a diagnosis that you didn't want to hear that causes you tremendous, tremendous pain, tremendous concern, tremendous fear. Maybe it's something that's been said to you. Maybe it's, been, it's something that's been said to someone you love, but you've heard these things and you don't know what to do with them and it causes you pain and it causes you to hurt. Perhaps you've gone through affliction or you've seen others who have and, and you begin to question, and you begin to wonder. And, but I've discovered and am discovering and, and let this be something that perhaps some can receive and others perhaps one day might. Because there's never been anything that I've gone through that God hasn't used for good for me. And I didn't know that at the beginning because when things hurt me or things caused pain or disappointment, I did not know that that was part of the way God was going to make me into the man he, he wanted to make me to be. I didn't know that. I've had people ask me if I could change anything in my life, what would I change up to this point? And I, at one time when I was young, I, there were several things I could say, well, I wish this or I wish that. But now at my age and at my experience with the Lord, I've been asked that, what would you change if you could change one thing? And the answer is nothing. Because everything I've gone through has resulted in who I am. Everything. Everything. The joys and the pains have all worked together to make me into who I am. And you know what? I enjoy being who I am in the Lord. I do. I'm very, very, I'm very happy to be who I am. I don't know how that sounds. I hope it doesn't sound arrogant. My name isn't Elihu. I'm simply saying <laughs> that what God has done has been for my good. All things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things. Uh, I have a, uh, I, I, don't, I, I didn't know if I'd be able to read this. I think I can. Uh, I, I was looking into poems and things that related to pain, and this one says this. I'll read this to you, and it, it makes my point. Pain knocked at my door and said she'd come to stay Though I would not welcome her, but bade her go away, still she entered. And like my shade, she followed after me, and from her stabbing, stinging sword, no moment was I free. And then one day another knocked most gently at my door. I cried, no, pain is living here. There's no room for more. And then I heard his tender voice, it is I, be not afraid. And from that day he entered in, the difference that it made. For though he did not bid her leave, my strange and welcome guest, he taught me how to live with her. And no one ever guessed that we would dwell so sweetly here. My Lord in pain and I, within this fragile house of clay, while years slip slowly by. I like that. It says it all. He didn't remove my pain. He just came alongside of me in it. And that's what I needed. And so... He delivers the poor in their affliction, opens their ears in oppression. He teaches them lessons that they wouldn't learn any other way. And some of the things that you perhaps have gone through or are going through right now, well, part of those things and I'm sure that you're learning, you wouldn't have learned any other way. These are lessons that you learn where no matter how far you seem to travel down the path of pain, he's still there with you. He never leaves you, and he never forsakes you. And many times, he's simply carrying you as you go through it. In verse 16, indeed, 
he would have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place where there is no restraint, and what is set on your table would be full of richness. When he says in verse 16, he would have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place, he's saying you would have been restored had you accepted your afflictions, Job, had you learned the lessons. He would have taken you out of the cramped place that you've been in and he'd have put you into a broad, open place. Notice he said in verse 16, what is set at your table would be full of richness. When he says what is set at your table, it's, it's a way of saying you would have complete satisfaction. It's like what it says in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. So he takes you out of your distress. He would have t taken you out of your distress, and he would have put you in a place, but you didn't learn your lesson. In verse 17, you're, you're filled with the judgment. Do the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of you because there's wrath. Beware, lest he take you away with one blow, for a large ransom would not help you. Avoid it. Will your riches or all the mighty forces keep you from distress? Do not desire the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed. Do not turn to iniquity, for you have chosen this rather than affliction. You have acted in the same way that wicked people act when they're judged. You see, Job, I haven't seen in you any repentance. Judgment has taken hold of you. When he says in verses 18 and 19, because there is wrath, beware, lest he take you away with one blow. He's saying, you by your constant arguing are now provoking God's wrath. God's going to judge you, Job. You need to repent quickly. Nothing can keep this from happening, including a ransom or everything that you own. He says in verse 20, do not desire the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, do not turn to iniquity, for you've chosen this rather than affliction. Do not desire the night. When he says do not desire the night, that's a, that's a picture of death. Do not be desiring death. You see, because sometimes people experience that when they're going through his wrath. He says do not, do not turn to iniquity. Don't speak against God as some do when they're in pain. And there are those, many of us, who have been in pain and so angry that we actually speak against the Lord, that we actually have raised our voices to him and said, how could you do this to me? How could you allow this to take place? Why did you do this? There are many who have done that. He's saying, don't be doing that. Don't turn to iniquity. Don't speak against God. He says in verse 21, you have chosen this rather than affliction. You've chosen to wish to die and to complain against God instead of trusting him. You didn't humbly wait upon him. You didn't pray. You didn't quietly submit to him, Job. And then he goes on in verse 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Who has assigned him his way? Or who has said, you've done wrong? God is powerful. God is teaching you a timeless lesson, Job. Don't argue with him. Don't try to correct him as he does this. Like he said in verse 23, who has said you have done wrong? How, how can I say to God, God, you have done wrong when he's God and I'm not? And the point is just learn the lessons that God is teaching you through all of this. He says in verse 24, remember to magnify his work of which men have sung. Everyone has seen it. Man looks on it from afar. You need to remember his mighty works, and you need to give him praise. Everyone can see how great he is, and they would see how awesome he is if they would simply open their eyes to see. So he says in verse 26, Behold, God is great. We don't know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. For he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it, covers the depths of the sea. 
for by these he judges the peoples. He gives food in abundance. He covers his hand with lightning, commands it to strike. His thunder declares it, the cattle also, concerning the rising storm. God is awesome, Job. We're not capable of fully understanding him. God is beyond. He's past our finding out. If God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know him. If God did not choose to say, this is who I am, we would never know him. We would not seek after him because like Adam, we were hiding from him and not pursuing him. And that's why God had to say in the Garden of Eden, Adam, where are you? It's not that God was lost. It was Adam who was lost. And by nature, we have a tendency of moving away. That's why Paul would say in Romans 3, there is none who seeks after God. We have a tendency of moving away from him and not close to him. So God is the pursuing God. God is the one who reveals himself to us. He did it in the Old Testament. He did it through miracles. He did it through signs. He did it through prophets. He did it through his word. But in the New Testament, God said, I, the invisible God, am going to reveal to you who I am by taking upon myself human flesh and dwelling amongst you so that you now can see that which no one else has seen. You will see God amongst you. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. That's what John said in chapter one of the book of uh, the gospel of John. He took upon himself flesh, the invisible God, the God who gave the command, make no graven image. God took upon himself human flesh so that people would see the invisible God made flesh. That's called the incarnation. And God, if he is, chooses to not be found, then no one would find him. Truly thou art a God that hidest thyself, Isaiah said. He could hide himself in a way that no, would see, no one would see him. But he, instead of doing that, he, he's, he took upon himself flesh and he became in that picture of the shepherd who seeks out the, the sheep that has wandered away. He's like the woman who found her lost coin or he's the father who waited for his lost son. And that's what God has done for us. But if God were to choose to hide himself, there, was, there would be none who could find him. So he reveals himself to us. He reveals himself fully through Jesus Christ. We, we don't know, we cannot know him by seeking in the sense of with my, my finite carnal mind, I, I cannot grasp those things. That's why in Romans 11, 33 and 34, that's why Paul would say the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? When's the last time God texted you with a question? <laughs> who became his counselor? So no one can fully know him without him revealing himself to us. He's so deep, none could fathom him. As long as we're in the flesh, we cannot, we cannot hope to completely completely comprehend in first Corinthians. So in chapter 13, verse 12, Paul said it like this. He said, now we see, but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall fully know even as I am fully known. So to know God, well, to know Jesus is to know him. In Colossians chapter uh, two, verses nine and 10, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. The way to know him is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And then finally, he says, for by these he judges the peoples. He gives food in abundance, covers his hands with lightning, commands it to strike. His thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. By the rain, he brings judgment by withholding it. When it comes in abundance, it's a sign of his provision, and it's a blessing. And even cattle know when a storm rises and strikes, when God is moving through nature, even the cattle have fear. It says in verse 33, his thunder declares that the cattle also concerning the rising storm, they become concerned out there. I'm, I'm no cowboy, 
I know we have cowboys in the church. I'm no cowboy. But I'm certain that when you're out there with your cattle, they get kind of nervous when they start smelling a storm coming or sensing a storm coming. And that's the point he's making. His thunder declares that the thunder causes the cattle to become stirred because they're aware of these things. And he's simply saying God has used nature to re reveal the reality of uh, the creator. Every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. And even nature can be used to awaken people to the reality that there's something greater than themselves. That's why the psalmist would say when he looks into the heavens and considers them as being the works of God's fingers, his finger work, he said, I can't help but think, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you'd even consider him? Because the deeper you see in God's creation, the deeper you see its handiwork and perfection, the more admiration you have for the one who designed it. God can reveal the reality that he is here by his nature. And we'll see this in chapter 37 next time. But it takes his spirit to reveal to us who he is. And that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgments so that we would know that without him we're lost. But with him, we can be something brand new. And Elihu's arguing with Job here, and he's saying, Job, you're really foolish to argue with God. And he's been laying out his argument, but he's not concluded yet. We'll pick that up next time. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, if we ever have the opportunity to someday once again, just sit outside, even when it's raining, to sit in a, a safe place, but, but to hear the sound of the thunder and the movement of the wind and smell the freshness of rain. Those are all evidences of a creator. Even animals can be aware that there's something greater than themselves. I think that sometimes we human beings forget. So Lord, I would ask that in the quiet times of our lives, even in the times of affliction and pain, the times of sorrow and hurt, and the times of loss, that we would find our comfort in you and that those times of affliction and pain would serve to be the times that we drew closest to you and even as Paul had said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, that the comfort that you give to us as we've gone through these things, may it be the comfort that we give to others. Because suffering is never without a purpose. Affliction. Affliction can, can actually work a depth into our hearts, a depth of joy a depth of comfort, and even a depth of love for you. For no matter where it is we are, no matter what we've gone through, you have never left us, nor have you forsaken us. And in this, Lord, we thank you. So I ask, Lord, that you would work in each one of us, and even as in a moment we're about to partake in communion, I, I ask, Lord, that we would realize the great cost for us to even have this moment, the cost of Jesus. He gave up his life for us. No one suffered like him. And I thank you that he suffered on our behalf. And may that cause us to love him even deeper than ever before. And even as our eyes are closed for another moment and our heads are bowed, there may be some right now who need to get right with God. In a moment, we're gonna receive communion you need to be right with God in order to receive of communion. And so I would ask you before we close this prayer, if you need to get right with him right now, whether on online or in this room, if you need to get right with God, if you have sin that you're dealing with, if you know that the Lord is speaking to you, perhaps you've walked away from him or maybe you never even, even have come to him, 
but you need prayer and you need to be right with him. You want a relationship with him and you need prayer. Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray that you would reach down and touch each person whose hand is raised. Wash, cleanse, Lord, and by your spirit, fill. And Lord, have your ways. Have your way in them. They're yielding to you, Lord. Answer their prayer. And work within them now. Wash them, cleanse them. And fill them with your presence. And by faith we receive. And we thank you. Be there, Lord. Be there for them. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, we prepare our hearts now to receive from you of communion. In your name, amen.